Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. Today, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Florence Darnock-Veres for today's uh, top, uh, lecture. So this year's topic is, as you know, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, Achievements, Aspirations, and Challenges Ahead. We have uh, learned some political aspects of nuclear weapons and diplomacy, but it is also very important to study scientific aspects of nuclear weapons. So we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Ferenc uh, Daranaki Beres. So let me introduce uh, him very briefly. Dr. Ferenc Daranaki Beres is a scientist in residence at the James Madison Center for Nonproliferation Studies and holds a Master of Science and a PhD in High Energy Physics from Carleton University in Canada. He specialized in ultra-low radioactivity, background detectors, and has professional experience in the field of astroparticle physics, primarily neutrino physics. He has been involved in several major discoveries in the field of neutrino physics and has worked on several international collaborations in Canada, Germany, Italy, and the United States, including the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. He was a member of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory collaboration that won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. He is also a laureate along with his team of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Physics. He has contributed to more than 40 articles in academic journals. Dr. Darunaki Beresh recognizes that knowledge of science is crucial for understanding weapons of mass destruction and the security threats they pose. He has spearheaded several initiatives to promote science education at the Middlebury Institute, including a course entitled Science and Technology for Weapons of Mass Destruction, a requirement for all incoming nonproliferation and terrorism students. So today, I'm very happy to have Dr. Daranaki Beresh for today's lecture, the scientific, scientific aspects of nuclear weapons. So now let me mute myself and I am going to give a microphone to Ferenc. So now Ferenc, you have a microphone. Thank you, Masako, for the introduction. Um, I always start, when I talk about the CIF uh, conference, I always start with kind of a statement, let's say. First of all, it's a great pleasure to talk with you all today. I always feel a sense of shared passion when I speak with teachers, um, because I'm a teacher myself. I teach science and nonproliferation and terrorism graduate stu uh, students, and I'm very much interested in science education for non-scientists. The Critical Issues Forum, thanks to the leadership of Masako Toki, always focuses on cutting edge topics in nuclear disarmament. Of the many interesting themes and topics, in 2014, the CIF conference focused on the humanitarian perspective of nuclear weapons use, and discussed, among many other things, recent scientific research on the consequences of a small nuclear exchange, where we find that even then, if it's a small exchange, there are global consequences in the disruption of the climate and to the agriculture. We will discuss this in the second lecture that I will give. This makes the argument for disarmament stronger because if a country targets another country, everyone suffers. So there's a shared responsibility to really not using nuclear weapons. So this, this year's topic is nuclear, nuclear weapons ban treaty, which over 50 countries have signed, which was, I think, partly influenced by this important realization that there's no such thing as a small nuclear exchange. Everybody is a victim. Um, the existence of more than 15,000 nuclear weapons, of which the vast majority have a yield greater than the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, are often considered to be something that we should just accept and that the citizens, citizens is you know, powerless to do anything about it. The success of the Ban Treaty has proven otherwise. The late noted psych psychiatrist Jerome Frank in his 1967 book, Sanity and the Survival in the Nuclear Age, Psychological Aspects of War and Peace, emphasized some key roadblocks that prevent making progress in nuclear disarmament, which in my opinion is really still relevant today. One of those roadblocks that I sometimes encounter is that people feel 
that they don't know enough about nuclear weapons to make a meaningful impact. Students and faculty and citizens don't want to talk about a subject that makes them feel uninformed. Despite being a science teacher myself, and despite talking to you about science in my lecture for the CIF conference, I strongly feel that this should not be a roadblock for you or for your students or for anyone. For example, the best example that I know is that you don't need to know the inner workings of a car or a computer to have a strong opinion about the safety of a car or the security of the internet. I'm also sure that the politicians that have their finger on the trigger don't understand the details of an uncontrolled chain reaction that I'm going to be talking about today. And they may know way more than they do about the inner workings of a, of a nuclear bomb after these lectures. As Bill Wickersham in his book, Confronting Nuclear War, the Role of Education, Religion and the Community says, the first order of business of nuclear disarmament educators, activists and organizers is to help others overcome any sense of insecurity they may feel when working on the problem. They may easily do so by going uh, immediately to the bottom line and simply pointing out that nuclear weapons are immoral, illegal if used, and incredibly uh, ex uh, expensive. Something like nuclear disarmament has many sides to the concept and is by definition interdisciplinary. A historian can make just as valuable insights as a scientist, a scientist as valuable as an ethicist, a citizen just as valuable as a politician. Now, this doesn't mean that science is not absolutely necessary to dive deeper into certain aspects of the field, which I'm going to discuss now um, when I discuss the scary notion of nuclear famine, which is actually the next lecture, and nuclear winter. But since nuclear weapons affect everyone, we all have a right to voice our opinions. And I think that's a very important thing to, to point out. Okay, let me just start with the main part of the lecture, which is what are nuclear weapons? So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the physics. Um, and I encourage you, if you have questions about my lecture, contact me and be happy to, um, to answer them. Masako, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Ah, okay. So this is just an outline of my talk, which is fission and the nuclear difference. Um, I'm going to be talking about critical mass and a little bit about nuclear weapon design, the two types of nuclear weapons, which is the gun type design and implosion type nuclear weapons. Then I'm going to discuss briefly fission products and the sources of radioactivity. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about boosted and multi-stage nuclear weapons, and those are the more advanced uh, modern weapons, and a little bit um, about nuclear testing. And then the next lecture is going to be about nuclear weapon effects. Okay, so this is kind of the modern view of the carbon atom. This is what you remember <laughs> from chemistry, right? We have the center nucleus, which has six protons and six neutrons. It's kind of like this hard, dense center and a much less dense cloud of the six electrons that are, uh, that are around, uh, around the nucleus. Now, um, when we think about this is, uh, you know, we consider this an isotope of carbon-12. I'm going to talk in more detail about what isotopes are. Um, but in 1% of the time, we find that the carbon-13 atom, it has instead of six protons and six neutrons, it has seven neutrons because the number of particles is six plus seven, which is 13. So then you would label it um, uh, carbon-13. Now, the important thing is chemically, these isotopes of carbon all behave like carbon. But in the nuclear world, they behave completely differently. I'm going to talk about uh, that in more detail. So elements versus isotopes. A chemical element is one type of atom distinguished by the number of protons in the nucleus. That's called the atomic number. They combine into molecule which have specific chemical properties. Water is H2O, they're familiar with, and trinitrotoluene uh, or uh, TNT is a much more complicated um, a, a combination of, uh, of elements, which is a well-known explosive. An isotope of an element has the same number of protons uh, as the element, but it differs in the number of neutrons. And that was the difference between carbon-12 and carbon-13. Now, if you have a chemical reaction, that can actually produce, uh, you know, it, as you know, with explosives and so on, that's all chemistry. Um, you get a certain energy being released called E. But for nuclear reactions, that E is much larger. A lot more energy is given off in uh, nuclear reactions. Now, isotopes are kind of like the types of milk, and that's what I just want to really want to emphasize. Here I'm introducing three different isotopes of hydrogen, 
which is you know H1, a hydrogen one, let's say, just simple hydrogen, which is one proton and no neutrons. Then there's deuterium, which is H-2, which is uh, one proton and one neutron. And then you have tritium, which is one proton and two neutron. In both cases, in all three cases, the number of protons is the same because that tags the element. All the elements, all, all the isotopes of hydrogen will all have just one proton, just like all isotopes of carbon will all have six protons. It's kind of just like different types of milk, like skim milk or 1% milk or something like this. In the end, it's just milk, right? Um, so the interesting thing is that chemically, these different uh, isotopes, but it's hydrogen, deuterium, or tritium, will all behave exactly the same. But in the nuclear world, they'll have very, very different properties, and some isotopes will be very, very radioactive. Now, what does that mean? When something is radioactive, it describes the property that some isotopes will over time decay or change from one isotope to another isotope. And this may even be a different, in fact, most of the cases, it's a different element. And in the process, um, it will release a little bundle of energy, which is like a particle. Um, so this can be, let's say, a fast electron, can be a neutron, uh, can be a gamma ray, can be many different things. And these particles shoot out like bullets. And I really want you to think of this um, analogy with bullets because it's going to become uh, even more um, important when we talk about um, nuclear weapon effects. So the main point is that when something is radioactive, it tends to decay from one type isotope to another isotope, which may be a different element. And in the process, it gives off little bundles of energy, which are kind of like, like bullets. Now, when something decays, it actually changes from one isotope to another isotope, which is, you know, a different element. So here is cesium-137, which I'm going to be talking about later, which is a very um, dangerous material. Um, it has a 30-year half-life, and I'll talk about what the half-life is next. Um, so it stays around for a very long time. It will decay over time into barium-137, a completely different metal. It's like alchemy. So... You can think of these, keep in mind of the energy of these bullets. Like if you have more of the bullets, you know, more da you can do more damage on the whole. And if you have bigger bullets, which is in this analogy is more energy, you can also do more damage. So nuclear reactors or weapons use a special class of isotopes that exhibit a property called fission. And that's gonna focus on next. That doesn't happen in many of the different uh, um, elements but it happens in uranium and it happens in plutonium, and those are the ones that I want you to focus on. If I want to, uh, so if, if I dig in the ground and look at uranium, I'll find that about 0.7% is going to be the isotope uranium-235, and 99.3% is going to be uranium-238. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember that um, this, they're both the same element, so the number of protons will be the same. So in the case of uranium-235, it has 92 protons, and then the difference is going to be 142 neutrons, because 92 plus 142, if I did my math correctly, is 235. And in this case, um, in, in, in case of plutonium, so now we're talking about this side here, plutonium-239, um, it's 94 protons, because that's what, uh, what the element plutonium looks like, plus 145 neutrons. And so that's how you get the 235 and the 239. So here, in the case of uranium, uranium-235 and uranium-238, you just you can just dig in the ground and you can find that, uh, that it's made up. If you look at the element of uranium, you'll find that about 0.7% is going to be uranium-235 and the rest is going to be uranium-238. So that you can find in the ground. Now, in the case of plutonium on this side here, and plutonium-239 is what's really useful for uh, nuclear weapons, um, you actually have to produce it in a reactor. Um, so it's not, you, you don't find it in the ground, you don't dig it and, and mine it, it's actually produced in the reactor. So it's a little bit different from the case of uranium. Now, chemistry versus nuclear physics. If we talk about chemistry, we're really talking about the atoms that bond to form, form molecules. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's chemistry. Let that energy be represented by E chem. Now, if we look at the nuclear world, so just really think of these two different nuclear uh, worlds, <laughs> different regions. Um, if we look at the nucleus, then we find that the protons and neutrons are bound in the nucleus 
um, to much, much higher energies. And the energy here is 10 to the exponent 6, that's a million, and here 100 million times more energy than the energy that's, you know, that, that's in the, uh, uh, that forms molecules together and that keeps, me, keeps the seat up and me not falling through the seat. Um, it's really amazing how much energy is in the nucleus compared to what's in the electrons that form the molecules um, and so on. So you really can't blame that people want to try to access that energy uh, any way that they can. So let's look at the fission process. Um, so in, in this case, um, we have a neutron that comes in and it hits the uranium-235. That's, that's the isotope that I showed you earlier. So that's this one here, uranium-235 here. And it splits it into two or three pieces. And in the process, and this is what's so dramatic, it gives off neutrons. So it gives off neutrons here. Two or three neutrons come off. Also in the process, it releases other particles, not just neutrons. Things like gamma rays, which are high energy uh, X-rays, you can think of it that way, or very fast electrons or other things. Um, those will all be released, released through the uh, fission process. Now, the amazing thing is this. So actually, the amazing thing is a lot of energy is released, but the amazing thing is this. Two or three neutrons are, are released. If you take one of those neutrons and it finds another uranium-235, then that will split. And if that split, that, that gives off more neutrons. And maybe if you take this neutron and find another U-235, then that will split. And that is how you start the chain reaction. And this is called an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction, where what you do is you have a neutron come in, it splits the uranium-235 or uh, plutonium-239, and then once it splits, it gives off a neutron, and that neutron finds another one, and then that splits, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so the number of splittings that you have is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You see that that increases very, very, very fast. It increases very fast. Now, imagine this. If I go back to this slide just for a second. Here I'm releasing 200 million electron volts per fission. If I'm coal burning, that's only 18 electron volts per atom. So you can see how dramatic the difference is in energy that's being, that's being released. Now, each time the splitting happens, you release 200 million electron volts. And so after only 82 generations, you produce, so this is 2 to the exponent 81, 2.4 times 10 to 24 splittings. So that's an awful lot of energy that that you're um, actually releasing. So just for fun, let's go through this in a little bit more detail. So if after 82 generations, I produce 2.4 times 10 to, 10 to the 24 fissions, and, two, and for each, each splitting, I get 200 MeV, I can convert this into joules. And joules are, are much more the uh, world that we're familiar with. So for example, a knee bend that we could easily do is just 100 joules, right? which is way more than this 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules, which is equivalent to this 200 MeV. Why that's important is now, if I take this number, the number of splittings, and multiply it times this number, then suddenly it doesn't become so small anymore because this number is so large. So what you end up is 7.68 times 10 to the 13 joules. Remember, joules is the unit of energy that we're more familiar with in you know, in the regular world, as I said, an E-band is about 100 joules. So it's way, way, way more. And in fact, that's equivalent to 18.3 thousand tons of TNT or 18.3 kilotons. So now you see that even if you have, have uh, 82 generations of splittings, that gives you so much energy, equivalent to 1.2 times the little boy bomb, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It's really incredible. And you can ask the question then, is how much mass is this? So how much, how much uh, nuclear explosive fuel or uranium-235 did we need to actually cause so much energy to be released? You may remember from chemistry the mole. 
and I'll just describe it just briefly. Mass scales with the size of the atom. Thus, an atom with six protons and six neutrons, which is in the case of carbon, and A, is the atomic mass, is going to be 12. It will weigh as much as two atoms of three protons and three neutrons, or A equals six. So a unit called the mole corresponds to a large number of atoms, and that's connected to A grams of material, or the atomic mass grams of material. So for example, for uranium-235, where A is 235, that means that 235 grams of that material is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. And we know that four times that number is equivalent to this 2.4 times 10 to the 24, which we found from before is the amount of fissions that you get after 82 generations. So once we do this, we find that four times this is equal to four times 235 grams, and that's equal to 940 grams. In other words, to release the amount of energy um, you know, that, that destroyed the city of Hiroshima was only 940 grams of uranium. It's an enormous amount of energy um, in, in the fission process. It can be used for good or for bad. So this is what I call the nuclear difference. So on the left side, I'm showing one kilogram of TNT that's being blown up. So this is one kilogram. And on the right side, I'm showing one kilogram of uranium-235. And this is uh, the, you know, the mushroom cloud um, um, of Hiroshima. It's a devastating difference in terms of energy. So on the left side is chemistry, and on the right side, it's nuclear physics. A useful analogy to think of this way is to think in terms of mousetraps. So here what I've done, I've showed this picture of uh, mousetraps with ping pong balls on them. So here's one, two, here's another, um, and so on. And they're all set side by side. Now, randomly, I, I trigger one of the mousetraps to go off. Well, what will happen is the ping pong ball will shoot off and it will hit another mousetrap and then that will go off. And then once that goes off, it, it it'll bounce to another one and that will go off. And so you can kind of simulate the chain reaction this way. So again, just to recap, the mouse trap is the, is the nucleus essentially. And these neutrons, the, the, the ping pong balls are the neutrons. So each time that a neutron hits one of the mouse traps, two of these neutrons or these ping pong balls will fly off. So here is a demonstration of this. Now, in a very graphic way, this is how nuclear weapons work. This is essentially how nuclear weapons work. Now, the trick to this, as you can imagine, is to get a very fast chain reaction. You don't want to slow things down. You want to make sure that if two ping pong balls go off, they'll hit another ones, and then that's so on, so on, so on, and it happens very fast. The trick to that is that you increase the mass of material that you need to have. So imagine, for example, with the mousetrap idea, if I set the mousetrap, uh, if I have very, very small amount of mousetraps, then those ping pong balls will just simply escape and it won't continue, uh, in continue the chain reaction. So the trick here is actually increasing the mass of material or in that analogy, to increase more of these mousetraps uh, side, beside each other. Um, and the trick to this is the key to nuclear weapon is really managing the neutrons or in this case, an analogy, the uh, ping pong balls. Make sure that there are enough neutrons to continue the chain reaction and make sure no neutrons escape or get absorbed um, through other interactions. So this brings us to the Kinn's concept of critical mass. So in this slide, what I'm showing is different critical, this is in blue, different uh, masses of uh, uranium-235. So let's look at this case. This case is a small mass and this case is a large mass. And what you see is that neutron comes in and you know, it, it causes fission in some, but a lot of the neutrons will just tend to escape. And that's what I'm showing here with black arrows. 
So fissions will stop after really after the second generation. But now, if I increase the amount of material, then I start the reaction here, but some will go backwards, some will go forwards, and so on, so on, so on. They'll find other U-235s, and this will continue the chain reaction because um, less will escape compared to more, will be, more fissions will be produced. Now, in the last picture, what I'm showing is, I'm showing the same amount of material here as I had before um, in, a, in the left, left side of the picture. But instead of letting these neutrons, the black arrows, escape, I'm, letting, I'm putting a reflector around there. So what, do, what I'm doing essentially is the plexi, uh, plexiglass box around the video as I, I was showing you. And in that case, you can get away with having a smaller mass of fissile material or, or uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Um, and you can have a uh, reflecting material um, around it. So you can get away with having less material. So now the definition of critical mass is that you have enough material that on average more neutrons are produced um, than they escape. Now one important thing is you can see here how the critical mass really depends on the configuration. If I took this piece here, which is this large ball, large sphere, and I made it into a pancake, then what will happen is a lot of those neutrons will just simply escape. So actually the configuration of the materials is very important and that's what nuclear weapon design is all about. Now there's two types of uh, nuclear weapons um, and it's really two ways of assembling nuclear material to attain a critical mass. Because you, what you wanna do is increase the chance of a neutron um, hitting, other, hitting a nucleus and then splitting and so on and so on and so on. So one way is called the gun type design and this is what I'm gonna talk about next. And here the idea is that you say you have half critical mass and in practice it turns out to be much more than half critical mass and you slam the two pieces together very quickly so that it assembles um, into one critical mass and then, or a little bit more than one critical mass. So in that case, you, you know, the, the explosive chain reaction starts. Another way of doing this is starting with kind of a, a hollow sphere or a shell of, uh, of plutonium or uranium-235, which in itself is not a critical mass, but when you compress it together and you do this with high explosives, then it reaches a critical mass. So it's really the two types of nuclear weapons. Um, and these are the old type of nuclear weapons. These were the type of nuclear weapons that were uh, unfortunately released on Hiroshima and the, in the city of Nagasaki. So another picture of this gun type design you have um, two pieces, in this case, it's a hollow uranium bullet, and then you have a cylinder, which is the target, which is um, also uranium-235, or high percentages of uranium-235, and then you slam the two pieces together, and it reaches critical mass, and, and then you have a trigger with a neutron, and it'll start the chain reaction and produce an incredible amount of, um, uh, of energy. So here the idea is really you're increasing, you're reaching critical mass by increasing the amount. And the analogy I use here is what I call the crowded room analogy. If you imagine that you open a door and these are two rooms with let's say people in them, right? And they're randomly moving around. Um, and you open a door, if you imagine that you're kicking a soccer ball or something through the door, um, chances are if it's just a small room like this, so not with the second room, then um, it'll just go straight through and it won't sustain a chain reaction. But if you increase the amount of material, then the chances are much higher that you can continue and you'll, you'll hit somebody and then that person will kick the ball to somebody else and so on and so on and so on. And that way you can sustain, sustain the chain reaction. Now, the important thing about gun type design is that testing of the nuclear weapon is not necessary. And that's really an important concern. With modern, this is a quote by Louis Alvarez, who won a Nobel Prize um, some time ago. Um, with, uh, and, and his quote is that with modern weapon grade uranium, the background neutron rate is so low that terrorists, if they had such material, um, would have a good chance of setting off a high yield explosion simply by dropping one half of the material onto the other half. Most people seem unaware that if separate HUs, because you need to highly enrich uranium or high percentage uranium-235 material, is at hand, it's a trivial job to set off a nuclear explosion. His quote is, even a high school kid could make a bomb in short order. So this is why we really are concerned 
um, about um, highly enriched uranium and non-state actors, because uh, really the barrier here is um, getting the, the highly enriched uranium. Now, this was the type of weapon that was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima with uh, devastating effects, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Now, there's disadvantages of gun-type weapons, which is they're not very safe. You're taking two pieces that are subcritical, so they're, they're half, half critical, um, but if they're inadvertently combined or for some reason it could cause, this, cause an explosion, they're not very efficient, um, they don't produce a very high yield, but we really are concerned of, uh, that this type of weapon could be used by non-state actors or terrorists. Now, plutonium-239 will not work in a gun-type design. It's something called pre-detonation. So you have to use another technique to be able to do this. And this is where the implosion-type weapon um, comes in. And it's much more complicated design. We only think, we only think that nation states will be able to do this. And the idea is this. You start with a, with a spherical shell, say, and, and that's what I'm showing here in this, this uh, crowded room analogy again. But in, you, so you start out with a very large room with lots of people, um, but not enough to actually uh, sustain the chain reaction. But then what you do is when you compress them, you bring, in, bring them close together so that you have a much higher uh, probability of uh, sustaining the explosive chain reaction. And you do this using explosives. So what happens is, um, it's something called, kind of think of it, it's called the rocket effect, where what happens is, is something explodes outward, it has a recoil inward, and so you compress that shell um, of uranium-235 or the fissile material so that it becomes much more dense um, than it was um, otherwise. Now, the difference from a gun-type design is to actually need to test this weapon. And thank goodness the CTBT is there, which is Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization with the International Monitoring System um, in place where there are sensors around the world that we will be able to detect even if there are very small yield um, nuclear tests. Now, through the process, when there is a nuclear weapon, um, it produces many what are called fission products. So if you think about this, what I talked about earlier, neutron comes in, it hits uranium-235 or it hits uh, plutonium-239, splits it, and then what's going to be left over is two pieces of different, uh, different elements and different isotopes. Now, those isotopes tend to be radioactive. Not all, but some of them will tend to be radioactive. And these will give off the bullets that I talked about earlier because it will be radioactive and want to decay to other isotopes, and in the process, it will give off many bullets. Now, these bullets are the ones that are dangerous to us. The, the, the bullet analogy really goes very far, um, because it can, it can basically uh, damage you um, on the inside. I'll talk more about that when I talk about nuclear weapon effects. Now, some of these long-lived uh, fission products are cesium-137 and strontium-90. These isotopes have um, essentially 30 year half-life, which means that they're going to hang around for a very, very long time. So a half-life is the time that it takes for half of the material to decay to another isotope. So if it's 30 years, that means whatever material you had before, after 30 years, half of it will have decayed to another isotope. If you wait another um, 30 years, then half of that will decay and so on and so on and so on. So over time, the material will decrease um, but if you have a 30-year half-life, it's going to stay around for a very long time. So uranium-235 and plutonium-239, they split asymmetrically, these fission products. So that's why I have your FP1 and FP2. Um, in the case of strontium-90 and cesium-137, strontium-90 um, is produced, which emits a beta particle, or that's just a fast electron, with a high percentage of the time that you get a fission product, uh, that you get a, get a fission, you actually start producing strontium-90, this very dangerous material. It's very nasty. The body mistakes it for calcium um, deposits in the bone. In the case of cesium that I also just mentioned earlier, um, it's produced 94% uh, of the time it, it emits a, a fast electron um, and then decays to barium-137. And so this is also the case where the body mistakes it for potassium 
um, which is required for all living things. So this is the problem is that these materials, they, they are kind of imposters in the body and they, they um, instead of the body taking up potassium or calcium, it will, if, if the strontium and the cesium is there, it will take those up um, instead. And the betas or these fast electrons deposit all energy in a short distance in the tissue. It's dangerous if ingested or inhaled. Um, and gamma radiation tends to be very penetrating, and can damage cells and lead to cancer. The damage is related to the, to the type and the number of particles emitted, like the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. Now here you can see, this is from a reactor, not a bomb. But what you see here is all these waves here. This is time. So in the, on the horizontal scale, you see it in terms of time. This is time in years. So 10 to the exponent minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 means this is 0 0.001 year. So this is less than a day. Uh, this is one hundredth of a year. This is one tenth of a year. This is one year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, and so on. So we're looking at how these different fission products um, decay over time. And what we're looking at on the left side is the activity or the, how radioactive the material is going to be. So this is for a reactor, not a bomb. But what you see is that these fission products, and here you can see there are all the different elements now, um, they stay around for a very, very long time. Here we're looking at 10, 1,000 years and we still have, uh, you know, there's been a, a strong change in the radioactivity level, but they're still, um, they're still radioactive. Now let's talk about modern nuclear weapons, which is boosted and multi-stage nuclear weapons. So this is all based on the concept of fusion. And now fusion is, as you know, probably there's a big drive to try to access the energy from fusion. And so far it has not been successful. The idea here is that you take something like um, uh, deuterium and tritium and combine them together, and in the process, you release high energy neutrons. In the case of uh, fission, what we had is we had the splitting of the nucleus producing two fission products, and in the process, re re releasing a lot of energy. So the two processes are different. In this case, the in the fission case, we're splitting the nucleus, and in the fusion case, we're actually combining the nucleus to form another nucleus. Now, the first case in which they use fusion is called the boosted nuclear weapon. We don't consider this actually a uh, fusion nuclear weapon. So it's not a thermonuclear weapon in the sense that you, you may have heard of. So in this case, the idea is that you have a certain amount of uh, fissile material in the bottom. So let's say uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And what you do is as it explodes, or, or just before it explodes, you introduce a small burst of DT or deuterium tritium gas. And once you do that, because of the, the fission process itself, it will raise the temperature to very high temperature. And what you need for fusion reactions to start is to reach a certain temperature to, to get the fusion engine to start, to, to, to get the reaction to start. So what happens in the fission process is you produce a very high temperature. D and Ts happen to be there because you injected it into the volume. And so you'll produce a huge, you know, another burst of neutrons. So remember the trick with the chain reaction. The trick was that the configuration had to be in a certain way to make sure that you can sustain the chain reaction. But as the bomb is exploding, the material will start to expand. And as it expands, you're going to turn off the chain reaction, or you're going to get less uh, neutrons to, to sustain the chain reaction. So having this fusion fuel there to, produ to produce that little burst of neutrons um, as this thing is exploding will give you higher efficiency uh, and, and more efficiency. And that's really what it's about, is the neutrons flood the core, increase the efficiency of the fissions, and so you produce more energy. So modern weapons also use boosting to decrease uh, the risk of predetonation, where the case is that you get, you, you know, you get an explosion when you uh, didn't expect it to be. And you can also use less uh, fissile materials. Now, there are also multi-stage weapons, which are more complicated. And in this case, you use a primary and a secondary. 
And the primary is basically your fission bomb that I discussed earlier, perhaps with a boosted, well, you probably need the boosted uh, case too, so you need the deuterium tritium as well. Um, and in this case, you use both fission and fusion to produce yield. As before, you acquire extremely high temperatures to ignite. This is what you need to have as a precondition for, for uh, getting this fusion reaction to work. Um, and what you're doing, in, in fact, is you're using the fission bomb to produce a lot of heat and uh, to raise the temperature of the secondary. And the secondary contains the fuel, um, the, the fusion fuel itself. So the idea is that the primary, it's called a primary, is a fission bomb, produces a great deal of heat, and that heat is transferred to secondary, which compresses the secondary, raises the temperature even higher, and so in the process um, will cause the fusion bomb to go off. This, by the way, is called a Teller-Ulam uh, mechanism. And it's actually, if you think about it, it's a very, very, uh, it's not an easy process because if you, if you, if the bomb goes off before the temperature in the secondary has reached enough high enough temperature, it just blows the secondary apart and you won't have a fusion bomb. So it has to be well timed and the distances have to be well calibrated and so on. And this is what nuclear weapon design is all about. Now, the amazing thing is that a several hundred kilogram bomb has the explosive power of uh, um, one megaton of TNT. One megaton of TNT. So this is, a, this is a, um, instead of talking about kilotons, which is a thousand tons. So remember, a ton is a thousand kilograms. So one kiloton is, um, is one million kilograms. And now I'm talking about a megaton. So it's a very, very large amount of explosive power um, that you have. So this is combining the knowledge of how fission, primer, how, how the, how fission works with fusion and then having the primary and the secondary to produce very, very large bombs. The energy that you need to have, I mean, this is basically how the sun works. The sun works with, uh, with fusion. And also, as you know, there's very high temperatures in the sun. So in terms of nuclear weapon types, there's the pure fission, which the gun type and the implosion type weapons that we discussed. Boosted, you insert a small amount of deuterium tritium gas. And then modern weapons, you use implosion weapon as a trigger for the fusion stage. And the implosion weapon or the, 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 um, the fission bomb itself is called a, a primary. And the, the fusion stage um, is called the secondary. It's an enormous amount of energy that's released. Um, the largest bomb that was released was 58 megatons. This is known as a Tara Bomba. But just to give you a sense, um, 40 megaton bomb, so one 40 megaton bomb is equivalent to one second of energy of the sun on Earth. It's just, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing fact. And of course, that can cause um, enormous damage, which you're going to be talking about in the next lecture. So I won't show you this um, this this video. I really urge you to look look this up on YouTube. And what you see is you can see. I'll well, start it a little bit. What you can see is you can start to see um, all the nuclear tests that have been conducted um, by the United States and all the other countries, and you'll see how it changes as the time continues, 1945, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then once you get to the 1960s and 1970s, you see how fast everything has happened, how many tests that have been conducted um, uh, over time. It's really incredible. Okay, so um, this shows you the amount of nuclear tests that have been conducted over the years, starting in 1945, which was, of course, first combat use, um, and then other tests that were conducted, Ivy Mike tests, um, Castle Bravo tests, all different tests that were conducted where they started experimenting with thermonuclear weapons or weapons that use fusion and multi-stage weapons. Then in the 1960s, the first, I'm, I'm kind of showing this by decade, what happens. And what you see here in blue is kind of a histogram of the number of nuclear tests that happened in, sorry, it's not decades, in, in five years. 
So it was 63, 228, 362. You see, really see how it takes off. And then there was the partial test ban treaty, which forced um, all nuclear testing to go underground, to happen underground. And you see how that um, increased um, 1970. Um, there were, uh, were in that, that five years, there were 825, 827 tests in 1975, 273, 265, 174, and you kind of see how it gets less and less and less as they're learning more about how nuclear weapons work. It becomes less important to do nuclear testing. Um, then in 1996, there was the CTB treaty, which is unfortunately still not in force, um, but uh, there has been a, a, a moratorium essentially on nuclear testing, at least a P5 moratorium. So that's, uh, you know, United States, um, UK, uh, France, and so on. Um, but testing still continues in, uh, in uh, North Korea, which is very, very um, disturbing and worrisome. Now, there's really no need for full-scale nuclear testing. This is a uh, quote by uh, Bruce Goodwin, who was the um, principal associate director for weapons at Livermore National Lab. He says, we have more fundamental understanding of how these weapons work today than we ever imagined when we, when we were blowing them up. And this is another quote from the National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, the, the top person there, administrator. We know more about the complex issues of nuclear weapons performance today than we ever did during the period of nuclear testing. So that means that from the US point of view, it's not really necessi necessary to do any nuclear testing. Now in the case of um, North Korea, they don't know as much about nuclear weapons as the United States um, uh, weapons experts do. Um, so for them, they need to still calibrate their, um, their different computer codes and so on. Um, so they still need to do more testing. Now, I want to just touch on this for a second. Um, we're going to be talking about the CIF about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And in it, there's one quote here, which is, be mindful of risks posed by the continued existence of nuclear weapons, including from any nuclear weapon detonation by accident, miscalculation, or design, and emphasizing that these risks concern the security of all humanity and that all states share the responsibility to prevent any use of nuclear weapons. And actually, this was the subject, uh, very interesting subject of the CIF conference a few years ago, um, where we, where we, where uh, Masako and the group looked at uh, the case of broken arrows, what are called uh, broken arrows, in cases where uh, mistakes happen. There are many cases where nuclear weapons were. Uh, where uh, inadvertently lost or, uh, you know, mistakes happened um, and so on. And so it's very important to be um, aware of that, that accidents can still happen. We're lucky that at this point, no accidents happened that actually led to a nuclear detonation, um, but accidents could happen. And so that's why it's very important to um, find a way to uh, make sure that this doesn't, doesn't occur. So this is just a summary. Um, there's vastly more energy from nuclear reactions than uh, chemical reactions. And this is how you can kind of think about it. Uh, think about this, um, small conventional explosions compared to a nuclear explosion, vastly, vastly different. Um, critical mass is the mass of fissile material required to sustain the chain reaction. Um, then in terms of time, we went through the first use phase, in which case the uh, Gun type design was uh, the bomb that dropped in Hiroshima. The implosion type design was dropped on the um, Japanese city of uh, Nagasaki. And then as the United States and the Soviet Union got into an arms race, they built better nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, you used better within quotes um, that wouldn't just go off, that were safer. Um, and with higher yields and smaller mass so that they could be put on missiles and so on. And then there was a stage of industrial scale production of nuclear weapons. And then now we're in the reduction phase and let's hope that that will continue. Okay, Masako. Okay. Uh... 
Thank you. Thank you, Ferent. So it was a very comprehensive lecture. And uh, for those who are not really big fan of a scientist, <laughs> don't be afraid. I think it was a very uh, useful lecture. But of course, if you have any question, please uh, contact us. So for those who are watching this video, I just wanted to uh, facilitate some discussion so that uh, we can also stimulate uh, some uh, additional thoughts. So you mentioned, friend, you mentioned um, several different kinds of uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, I know many people are now really concerned about North Korea's nuclear testing. And in fact, uh, North Korea is the only country that is actively testing recently. And uh, we hear a lot of news that they are developing uh, you know, more sophisticated nuclear weapons. So could you uh, give it just a, could you briefly uh, explain which category of nuclear weapons in North Korea is now uh, reaching? Or, <laughs> some, or if you know, no one knows, but uh, I mean, based on the, our, your educated uh, information. Okay, um, so we see it, of course, nobody knows. <laughs> but we see that there has been a progression over these last tests that they're uh, learning more and more about how these nuclear weapons work and progressing in their uh, technology. Um, the first tests were all not very high yield um, and not very, uh, uh, may not have been as so productive. But that's how they learn, they learn from their mistakes. This last test that was conducted was particularly a very, very high yield one. So this was, um, it's difficult to put it into scale, but 250 kilotons, so 250,000 tons of TNT. That's the equivalent of that one bomb um, that North Korea detonated in September. Um, we think that that bomb is, is, pro is either um, uh, a boosted device or is perhaps something like um, a multi-stage weapon or at least a thermonuclear weapon that uses uh, fusion fuel. The yield was just too high to just be an implosion design or something like this without um, a boosted component to it. So that's what we think, that this is really um, a modern uh, uh, weapon, not one of the kind of first generation if you want to think about this. We shouldn't be surprised by this. And the reason why we shouldn't be surprised is, if you think about it, there's, there, they have been putting so much emphasis on education and nuclear physics and so on. And thousands of students have graduated in nuclear physics, or nuclear engineering, or any related fields. So we, we shouldn't be surprised that they were able to develop very sophisticated nuclear weapons, especially since um, so much is written about nuclear weapons, technical details in journals and, and so on. So much information is available in the open source. So they won't necessarily make the same mistakes as the United States or, um, or the Soviet Union did in directions in which they went to with nuclear weapons. So we shouldn't be surprised that they, that they that, you know, that we might consider that it's going to be, a, that it's a thermonuclear weapon, not just simply a boosted weapon. That would be my guess. It's a thermonuclear weapon with a fusion component, and that's particularly scary. And so, for example, if they do more testing, then the emphasis might be on trying to make it um, less heavy so that they can fit it on uh, a missile. Thank you. And also, you also said, you know, nuclear weapons, bigger, better, safer, <laughs> boosted. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if we can say better nuclear weapons, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you said the bigger, but uh, now I also understand North Korea is trying to miniaturize a warhead, you know, so that uh, uh, they can put the warhead on the, the missile. So can you explain, it's a bigger, but uh, smaller, <laughs> that concept. Yeah, so th what they could do is they could, you have reflectors around the uh, weapon, and then what you can do is you can design it in a way, especially you can do this with a boosted, so that you might not need a heavy reflector on the outside, or there's certain components that you might not need by using certain types of fissile materials uh, in combination. 
And in this case, um, you can try to miniature, miniaturize it. But I'm not privy to the details of uh, nuclear weapon design, and I'm very happy that I don't, don't that the information is not commonly available. Um, but there will be a process of, of different tests that they need to do um, to try to see if they can, uh, you know, get a bomb to work without being very heavy. And what I mentioned before is that you have megaton bombs that are only a few hundred kilograms. So if you can, if it's only a few, a few hundred kilograms, then you can put it on an ICBM or on, on a missile. And that's really the, you know, the big concern. Okay, thank you. Also related, we recently also uh, hear on the news that the United States uh, is trying to modernize uh, nuclear weapons and also trying to make a more usable smaller nuclear weapons like uh, mini nukes, like uh, something like that. So, how? What's the? Do you have any definition of a, nu a mini nuke or I, I don't know? Uh, but what's the uh, like official term of a mini nuke? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what the official definition is, but these are kind of this concept from a while back. I think it was during the Bush administration um, when they talked about bunker busters. And the idea is to have nuclear weapons that will explode and destroy um, targets underneath. And you have an effect that once you, if you can barrel, uh, borrow, if, the, if, if you could borrow uh, deep, and you don't even have to be deep, let's say a few meters or a meter or so, then you have an kind of an uh, exaggerated or amplified effect um, uh, seismically um, where you can destroy um, uh, underground structures. Um, but this all depends on how deep you go, right? If North Korea decides to have particular assets, let's say where Kim Jong-un um, is located, um, then you know if it's really, really deep, then even a bunker buster will not be able to um, destroy, uh, you know, meet its target or, or destroy the target. So it's a crazy world to go into when you start talking about mini nukes. Okay, thank you. So uh, also when you were talking about the gun type of weapons and the implosion weapons, you said the gun type of weapon is relatively easy to make and uh, if you have uh, materials even a high school student <laughs> could make it. But if you have a materials, right? So could you also explain what's the most difficult uh, part in the process of uh, making nuclear weapons? Yes, I mean, the most important part is getting the material. You really hit it on the nose. And the material is highly enriched uranium or a high percentage of highly enriched uranium. So highly enriched uranium is 20% or more uranium-235 compared to all the other, other isotopes, so like uh, uh, uranium-238. And to actually use it in a nuclear weapon, you need to have much higher enrichment, not 20%, but more like, you know, 85% was used in Hiroshima, but more like 90% 90, 90 or 95% or, or so on. And you need to do that through the enrichment process. So you... And enrichment itself is expensive and, and more complicated. And that's why we don't think non-state actors or terrorists will actually be able to do the enrichment themselves. What they could do is steal the material. So they could steal the material from you know, particular laboratories or locations, uh, from uh, particular reactor fuels have a high, have high enriched uranium. Um, uh, but we don't think that they'll actually produce it themselves. So this is the, this is the one big barrier which is very important is uh, what you need is the, uh, uh, the fissile material like uranium-235. The other case is plutonium-239. I touched on this in the beginning that plutonium is not mined like uranium is. It's actually produced in a reactor and any reactor can produce plutonium. So this is why it's important that the IEA is there, the International Atomic Energy Agency is there to make sure um, that once, for example, refueling and so on, that plutonium is not being diverted for the use of nuclear weapons. So thank goodness that the IEA is there 
um, for that reason, to prevent that use, that used for nuclear weapons. So that's why uh, those, those are what I see are the really big barriers. And in the case of HEU, the uranium-235 that a high school kid could do, um, you know, maybe Louis Alvarez overstated it a little bit, but I, I, it's really much simpler than the other type of nuclear weapon. And the key is getting a hold of high enrichment HEU. And, um, and that's why it's so important to try to clamp down on all that material and uh, minimize the use of highly enriched uranium in the civilian sector. Great. Thank you so much, Ferenc. So as you said, um, next for your next lecture, we are going to study what the effect of nuclear weapons. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your second lecture. So again, thank you very much for watching the video, a lecture video. So I will, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, parents. Thank you.